Hello and welcome to the latest instalment of the Game Guru tutorial series. Today I would like to look at addressing the rock slide I mentioned a few videos ago that will stop players from returning to the castle once they've entered the forest. Now nothing like that currently exists as standard so we're going to have to create it ourselves in Blender which blends nicely into the topic of creating placeholder graphics to um, uh, take the place of something you're going to develop later but you want to implement now just to get it in to get the logic working things of that nature um, so we're going to use Blender 2.8 or 2.81 I believe is the current latest version to create a rough landslide and then import it into Game Guru and then get it working so it triggers as soon as you enter the scene and then remains um, an obstacle. Now, how I'm going to do this, I'm going to create a 3D model of a, a cliffside and then have rocks tumble into the valley um, here to prevent the player from returning back into the castle scene. Now, that will become visually clear once I start. Um, because I can't replicate the terrain I see here into Blender, I'm going to model actual cliff walls and a cliff floor. So when the rocks are falling into the crevasse, into the ravine, ravine um, they will not intersect with the terrain. It will kind of go over the Game Guru terrain as an entity. So the first thing I want to do is go into Blender and then create a... Um, a rough shape that mirrors the valley here in the Game Guru. So I will do that now. Um, from the initial Blender screen, the first thing I tend to do is press the A key and then press the Delete key. That gets rid of the camera, the light, and the standard cube that you get in the start of a Blender scene. Uh, even though we may actually use a cube, and we will use a cube, it's just something I do um, just to get rid of everything in the scene so I can start from a pure clean slate because we don't need the camera or the light in a Game Guru export. Um, before I start, I do want to say that this is not, traditionally speaking, a Blender tutorial. It's the simple fact that I'm using Blender to create a model for Game Guru, so I will tend to go over the tools which I use at the time, but this will be a quick create and export and import. Um, an artist would spend hours working on a particular model, and I will be spending about five minutes. So I would encourage you, if you're following along, to spend those time to, to watch the tutorials on Blender, really build the skill up to create your own unique works of art. Um, this is simply illuminating the steps to take to get something from A to B and working inside Game Guru. Um, that being said, I'm going to create a cube and I'm going to be using several tools in the next few minutes. Um, one is a modifier called Mirror. Um, the reason I use this is to create a symmetry in my model. Uh, because I'm creating a valley, um, it may be non-uniform when it's done, but the initial outline of it, the initial um, primitive shape, is symmetrical. It's, um, it's a valley. So by clicking on the spanner icon on the right, you can add modifier, and then select mirror from the generate um, section. Now, this will create a line of symmetry through a particular axis, and... If you go into edit mode, select face, and pull out the side you want to work with. Um, well, something I should say here, if you press the G key, you will be able to move your selected face or polygon in a free-flowing way. If you then press the Y key, the X key, or the Z key, it locks it to that particular axis. So if I press the Y key, 
I had moved that face along the y-axis, which is what I want to do. It's a great way to modify your model in a perspective view without resorting to the the fixed uh, um, the camera angles. Uh, it's a good little trick to know that one. And then come back over here to the modifier menu. And then I believe it's Y. And you can see new geometry has appeared, um, which has been mirrored from the, cent the pivot point, the center point of this object on the Y axis. Now, what that basically means is as I move this, that will move over there. Now, as you can see, something crazy is happening because the model extends over the mirrored plane, so you get this kind of deformity here. This can be resolved by bisecting and then flipping. Now, what that will do is any geometry going past the mirror will be, dis will be um, not ignored, will be merged into the geometry coming from the other direction to create a line of symmetry on the middle, on the plane at the middle. So no matter what happens on that end, you will always have that plane of symmetry. Um, the grayed out portion here is showing what the model looks like before the modifier, which will not exist after the modifier is applied. Um, this makes more sense as you physically do it. Um, it's not so easy to understand when I'm explaining it, and I'm aware of how it all sounds. But if you just follow it through and have a go yourself, you'll see kind of how it works. So if I use the extrude tool to pull out some additional geometry from this shape, and then if I press the number one key on the keypad, uh, press the number three key on the keypad, and I get the, um, the right orthographic view. If I hold down the middle mouse button, I can then rotate and it jumps into perspective. The reason to go for the right orthographic view is because I can modify the shape on a, on a face on view. Now, if you come to the top of the screen and select toggle x-ray, the mesh will sort of gray out. Now what that means is, is when you select vertices like so, it will select all the vertices on that plane, like here. However, if you do not have X-ray selected and you select vertices, it will only select the vertices that you can see. It won't select the back ones. Now we want to change the shape of this uh, valley. So I want the X-ray on. So, and then press G to move, freeform. Then you can mold the valley to suit your individual needs, like so. So I want a kind of a, a squarish base valley with tilting sides coming down at the edges. And so by freeform moving the uh, vertices on the one side of the mirror, it reflects to the other side of the mirror. Now, if I press the 7 key, I don't want this kind of chevron sign. So I'm going to say, where is this and bring it back over here now another thing I want to show here is this is quite unprecise it's not that neat if you press N you'll bring up the transform window which shows you within many many levels of decimal precision where a particular vertex is and you can use this to align things exactly as you want them to so this is the x-axis and I want this one to be minus 2 and it will jump to minus 2 and I want that to be minus 2. So you can use this to kind of create a much more um, precise uh, model. Not so much required here because this is a very rough landscapey thing but if you was doing some sort of tile which needed to tile together perfectly then this is a great way to do it, the transform menu. So I'm going to go to my uh, front view, grab all of this side, notice it's grabbing everything along the mirror, and then press G to move it, and then X to lock it to the axis, and drag it to about there. And I'm going to do the same 
on that side. And that creates to me a sort of valley. That's the kind of shape I'm looking for. At this point, I can turn off X-ray and apply the mirror modifier. Nope, nope. I have to come out of edit mode, go into object mode, and then apply the mirror modifier. Click. Okay. Now, all that's been committed. The line of symmetry is there. If you go into edit mode, you can see it's perfectly aligned to the center. The um, shape is roughly what I want it. And that is a good start. At this point now, I will save it. Um, and then start working on the rocks. And I will save it as rock file 2. The other files are me playing around previous to recording this video. Um, come back into object mode and I'm going to create by shift and A a mesh icosphere, isosphere, a rough sphere. Press G to move it, uh, X, Z to drag it up a bit and then it's S to scale it down a little bit to so let's say there. Now, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to create a physics simulation to have this rock falling into this valley. To do that, I'll need to set up a few things. If you go to the sidebar, to this little circular symbol, I believe it's supposed to be um, a, a, something orbiting something to represent physics, and then select rigid body, click, and do the same on the icosphere, click. When you press play down here, it will activate a physics simulation. And if I'm not mistaken, everything will fall out of the screen. For example, and there they go. So we'll stop that, bring it back. Um, that's because everything resorting is, um, everything's been affected by gravity. Now I don't want the valid to be affected by gravity. So I'm going to click this animated thing, which means this is animated by hand or by kinetic motion rather than being affected by gravity. But it's still a rigid body, so it will affect other atoms in the scene which are affected by gravity. So when I press play again, the rock will fall into the valley. Or it will sit there, not doing anything. <sighs> ah, go back to the beginning and then press play. Hmm. Yeah, because, because it's um, it's the bounding box. If I move this uh, up, if I move that up and press play, it would land on top of the bounding box of the valley. We want it to go in the valley. So what we have to do is pick the shape, uh, mesh and then press play and it will fall in. Um, the reason being uh, a mesh collision is more... it will use the shape of the mesh to determine how it interacts with other objects in the scene whereas a simple box or sphere is quite simply a, it's a primitive. A mesh takes more processing and so it's not a default option but it's what we want here. So when you press play on the simulation, the rock will fall into the valley and kind of not do anything. Now, as far as landslides go, that's a bit lame. So if we copy this rock, um, sorry, by pressing Shift and D, and then dragging a few iterations around, and then using your camera to say, yep, yeah, they're not touching each other, they're still kind of over the rock, and then press play again, go to the beginning and press play, all the rocks will fall in, interacting with each other and the valley, and then roll off and roll off down. Now we want these rocks to stay in the valley because we want them to stop the player. So I'll press stop, go back to the beginning, and then create a new object. Uh, a cube should do. And then move it to the sides, shape it, to act as a block and then move it 
so the rocks can't escape. Give it a rigid body. Give it an animated tab so it doesn't fall away. And then put another one on the other side. This way, when you run the simulation, the rocks fall down and stay in the valley. Now, there's not enough rocks, though. A landslide is not five rocks. So we can take those five, shift and D, move them, let's say, up, and run it again. The rocks fall down. Now, that's still not very many rocks. So, back to the beginning, grab them all, make another set, move them up more, and then play that simulation. There you go, that's more of a rock fall. Yeah? So, press play, they all fall into the valley like this, like that. And it stops at about frame 110. Remember that number, that's important. You can come down here to where it says end. Select 110, and then press play. See all the rocks falling in. You happy with that? Save it. Control S. Quick save. Once you're happy with your physics simulation, what we can do now is highlight all your isospheres, like so. Make sure you've got them all. Ah, I'm missing one. He will be that one. Yeah. Oh, something to note here. If you press G to move things on your cursor, but you don't want to do that, you press the right mouse button to cancel. Left mouse button will confirm the move. Right mouse button cancel. It'll go back to where you found them. It's a good way, I found, just for checking things. For example, if you've selected all the rocks and we didn't, we missed one, and that's so. It's a good way to see it. Anyway. Once you've selected all your rocks, okay, come to Object at the top, and then scroll down to Rigid Body, which will present you with some more options. From these options, bake to keyframes. Left click, and you get this um, pop-up box. Start frame 1, end frame 110. You may remember we set that down here. If you hadn't set it down there, you could just as easily tap it in here. This tells the, um, the baker how many frames you want it to bake of this physics simulation. Um, once you're happy with that, press OK. It will go ahead and bake all the animation data and you'll see this little squirrely arrow appear next to the um, icosphere. Whereas like, the cube walls and the valves and stuff have got this little symbol, all your spheres now have got this arrow symbol, okay? Which means they're no longer using the physics simulator they're actually using keyframe data, which has been baked into them based on the physics. So which means we can now delete these, which stop the rocks from escaping. When we press play, the rock fall will fall into it as we want it to in the game. We can now even delete that if we want to. No, we could delete that. But we actually want that because we're going to overlay that into our map for the rocks to fall into. Um, you could delete that and just have the rocks, but then you'd have some um, clipping issues when the rocks are kind of cutting into the terrain. Or you might have issues where the rocks look like they're falling into a hole, but there's huge gaps in the side. It doesn't look too good. If you spend enough time working on this, you could have a very nice rock kind of cliff model in your game. And it would kind of, it'd work. It's all about how much time you put into it. Um, but once you've got rid of the props that you don't need, or the gizmos, give it another save under a different name of save as, and then I tend to um, rock fall to underscore bake. Um, so if I ever needed to change the physics simulation, I can in the save file without the underscore bake. Um, once I've got this file now, I want to export it as an FBX. So file export FBX, it's a standard export format. And then over here on your options menu, experimental apply transform, I'll tick that. <coughs> Excuse me. Apply scalings, FBX unit scale, I'll select that. And down here, 
under bake animation if you click the arrow to expand the menu and turn these off if you don't turn those off it will export it in a weird way where each object is its own animation it's a bit weird I'm not sure it I suppose it's useful for things but it's not useful for us right here so once you've done that export to FBX it'll export the file and then now we can go back into game guru now before I go any further I usually like to check the integrity of the FBX file to make sure everything's exported correctly now there's several tools you can get for free which you can use to open up and look at FBX files um, very quickly very easily um, Ultimate Unwrap being one of them, our 3D Viewer is another. Um, if you load up the FBX file in your, your tool of choice, you can see this is the FBX file, and it's working exactly as I want it to. There's rocks falling from the sky, landing into the um, ravine, and being a very effective obstruction. Now I know that this works fine, I can import it into Game Guru. So if we go to Game Guru, and go to our forest scene as we um, as we remember it and then select um, from the file menu at the top of the screen import model navigate to the folder where you've got your file rockfall2 underscore bake dot fbx and then double click or single click and then open it will then import and convert the fbx file into a dbo file ready for a manipulation now from previous videos we know that this red guy here is a, a scale a scalar model to see how big it is and based on this it doesn't look very big you can't see it because it doesn't have a texture now I have got a texture file which I downloaded from a texture resource and it's called uh, cliffs now if we look at that it's just a basic cliff texture and I'm just going to stick that straight onto the model. I've not unwrapped it. I've not taken any time to make it look nice. I just want to make it visible. So if I click the grey box up here, navigate to where my um, models are stored, select SJPEG, and then select the image file it will appear there as you can see it's not pretty it's very tiny um, we can use this slider to increase the scale but it would be better if we didn't have to do that what may be better to do is to go back into blender and increase the size of the model there and re-export very simply and we don't need to change the scale of the model itself uh, that would be messy potentially problematic and not ideal what we need to do is change the scale of the model uh, during export so if we go to file export as fbx exactly as previously except this time where it says scale one change it to scale um 100 for example and then export that like so so when we come back into game guru file import model exactly as last time our fbx file double click and then when it loads in it should be significant ah proof in the pudding there's another scale model a tiny little guy which is more fitting to what we're creating so if we go to the gray box click it um, navigate to where your texture file is kept and then open that texture file we see this is a much better scale for the size of the person you can use the Y rotation slider to get a good look around it to make sure but remember to put it back when you're finished because we, it would be awkward to have an odd rotation on the Y um, collision mode box is okay because this is going to be a um, a blocking obstacle we don't need polygon precision collision because we don't want the player 
even having a chance to get through this. So keep it as a box collision, but the material is stone. Um, nothing else really needs to change here. So if you save the entity, it'll default to the user directory, and we'll call this rockfall. Um, yeah, just rockfall. And save. Now, we could load this now into the engine by clicking add new entity user and there's the rock fall but i'm not going to do that just yet uh, because we need to make a slight change to the fbe file before we proceed now in order to do this you'll have to navigate to the user directory which is here now the import object has created the dbo file of the rock fall it's created the bitmap file which is the thumbnail it's created the FBE file, which is the data about the model, and it's also brought in the texture file that we assigned it in the import process. If we open Rockfall, we can see there's a texture file, there's the DBO file, there's the scale, a NAS 100, because we changed the scale of the model in the art package, which is the correct way to do it. Um, but if you scroll down to the bottom, we have no animation data. That doesn't mean the FBX file doesn't contain animation because we know that it does because we've looked at it in a FBX viewer. What this means is we've not told GameGuru what the animations are. Now, we had 110 frames of animation in the Rockfall. Um, so what I like to do, just to make sure that everything's loaded correctly and it all works nicely is I'll make two copies, two references to that animation. Maximum animation of one, play animation editor, one. Okay? So what I've really done is I've told it where the animation starts and where the animation ends. I've assigned it to both animation zero and one. I've told it that the maximum animations it can have is one, and I want it to play the animation in the editor window. Once I've done that, I can save and exit the FPX file, come back to my game guru window, um, add new entity, and now I will add the rock file. Um, click, OK, and there's my rock file. So I can rotate it and place it as standard. So let's say I place it here. Now already you can see we have some form of success. Now, as I stated previously at the beginning of this video, this is not a finished product. This is a placeholder. Um, a good entity like this uh, could take hours to do to get the nice cliff textures to get it blending into the scenery and the, the, the scenes, blending to the floor, spend time working on the textures, painting it, getting the shades right, getting the textures, having decent rocks, and not just icospheres or isospheres. You, know, you could spend days making that into an amazing looking model. But for the purposes of right here and right now, I just wanted a way to stop the player um, going back to the castle. Now I'm going to stretch it out a little bit because I would like it bigger. Uh huh. And as you can see, this is a, an animating model we've just created and brought into it. And I can mess with the scales and rotations. And I'm going to test the game. Now, this isn't finished uh, because what we need now is a script. Um, to be created, which will tell the model to play its animation once and then stop at frame 110. Um, otherwise, as you saw in the editor, it might work, it might not. It might keep looping the animation. It depends what script it's got as standard. Uh, but really, it needs its own script writing to tell it exactly what it needs to do. Otherwise, um, random things could crop up which uh, are not expected because, quite frankly, it's not being told what to do. It's, it's got default instructions. 
And as you saw in the editor, the animation um, just repeated over and over again because that's what it was told to do in its, in its script. It's animation one, and as you see, and now uh, we we'll just watch this. Yep, it just loops over. Now the collision will work because it's um, a box collision. We can't get in, we can't get past, we can't get through. But we don't want it looping like this. So this is enough content for one tutorial because this is quite a lot of things have been covered here and I don't want to overload with information. I just wanted to show you the process of getting an idea, building a rough model in Blender, bringing it into Game Guru, and having it seen. You can interact, see you can't get past now. You can only go forward. Now, the next video, we're going to look at the scripting side of this, where we will create a script for this unique event, which will maybe hold the animation at frame zero until we get close, so the player starts here and thinks, oh, I want to go back. And when the player gets close, it will play that animation, the rocks will fall, and then stop, so the player can't get back. Now... Obviously, if you're stood here and it's not animating, there's just rocks levitating in the air. But that doesn't matter. This is just a placeholder. If you were to do this in your final game, you might have those rocks up on the side of the mountain, like rocks perched on the edge. And as you came close, they would then tumble down. That is up to the designer to do. This is just about how to do it. So I hope this tutorial has proven informative and hopefully some people will run off and have a go at this um if there's any questions about anything that's been covered leave a comment i'll try and get to it um until then until the next tutorial when we cover scripts i'm going to leave it there um thanks very much for watching and i will see you next time